Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Of course, it may not be evening where you are. We're in the uh, first of the winter moons, Itostoi, in Blackfoot, though I'm probably mangling the pronunciation. And um, I'm going to be both hiking up some steep hills and using my microphone. So we may get some extraneous noise and a little extra breathing sounds. (laughs) Um, The moon's about five days, we're about five days into this moon cycle. Uh, which began on October 6th. Um, In the last moon cycle, one of the trees that's very important to me produces pollen. Um, I often harvest some of that pollen, though I have a good enough supply for for the use to which I put it. I can see the moon um, right now. It's a uh, waxing crescent. Waxing, of course, means increasing, and waning means decreasing in English. The name for the moon in Blackfoot is Koko Mikitsum. I don't know the Blackfoot etymology for this word, Um, but Som uh, is often associated with the moon. And I'm by no means a scholar of Blackfoot. Uh, Though I have paid some attention to, I'm sure I can't pronounce this word either, (laughs) Nitsapawasan, which might be uh, translated as our way of life. But again, I'm pretty sure I mangled that one. I just, unfortunately, I don't hear, I'm not exposed to the language enough to be able to expand and correct my understanding of some of the, the words. Um, There's lots of unique changes that occur during the first winter moon. And what I find surprising is that um, our Gregorian calendars are nearly useless um, compared to moon calendars. Our solar calendars, it's not that they have no usefulness, but they misframe important cycles of relation and transformation, change, birth, death, rebirth, that are happening within those cycles of the moon, from one new moon to the next new moon. And those of us who pay attention to the moon and also to nature, because that's really the transformations in the activities and relationships in nature are one of the most important forms of news for living beings, for beings who live in the living world rather than in the world of abstractions and frameworks, systems, 
and um, commodified behaviors that are common to many human cultures and cohorts. The news that actually matters is the living news. What the birds are on about this morning. Are the crickets singing or not? Have the frogs laid their eggs? Um, how did their eggs fare this season? Were most of them eaten or did many of them hatch? Um, when do the owls begin to mate? When do the raptors mate? When do the deers mate? The uh, ungulates, when are they mating? Um, are the salmon running or not? Uh, which kinds of bats are out in the evening or which ones are missing? Um, and what are the new or anomalous situations that we can observe in the cycles if we become familiar with them over our lifetime? Right? If we've been uh, inclined to pay attention to, to lunar time. And in lunar time each year there are either 12 or 13 moons. Most years there are 12. But very few of us pay much attention to such things. It was once very common for people who grew food, you know, who um, cultivated food, and also people who hunted or fished to pay close attention to the moon. It was one of the, and not just the moon, but all, but, but sort of the, the, the spirit of the moon time, right? The, the phase zeitgeist. Uh, in German, uh, Zeit is time, Geist is spirit, um, and probably, though again I'm not a scholar of German, um, in thought the two words are reversed so that rather than, eh, it could be time spirit, probably is, yeah, it's probably time spirit, but it could be spirit of the time in English. <clears throat> and by spirit, um, we might both mean something somewhat metaphysical, but also uh, something visceral, the character of the relationships on this day of the moon cycle, on the next day of the moon cycle. And it's interesting, for example, that now that we've entered the first moon of winter, there's stark, obvious signs of transformation. Um, two nights ago was the first night that it was at all chilly in my home. Uh, and that was a few nights into this moon cycle. Now, of course, each of the seasons have kind of general character. Um, the beginning of winter is, is both, <laughs> it's, very, it's complicated. It's not just the beginning of death. It's not just the coming of death, but it is the coming of hardship for many beings and death for some. Um, and it can also be understood though, as the gap crossing time right? The trees don't die. They, they become senescent, right? Um, and many animals will hibernate. It's easier to skip over the, the harsh winter months and rest in that time and um, rejuvenate than it is to face that time directly day to day hunting and being vulnerable to the sometimes harsh weather, 
depending, of course, on where we live. Um, where I live and where I've lived most of my life, snow is pretty much a myth. Uh, we know that it happens, but we never see it. And it's very rarely is it cold enough to be dangerous, uh, unless one is elderly or sick or perhaps very young. Um, the degree of danger in the situation often varies according to, you know, sure, there's a general degree, right? But what comprises danger depends on who you are and how you are and where you are and how you have been in recent time and so on. But generally where I live, it does not become very cold. Um, and in many nearby places where I live, this is the same, but it also becomes very hot in the summer, dangerously hot. Um, in a number of places in California, it's regularly above 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. And it has become both hotter and colder in many places over particularly the past, I would say, 10 years. So I like it. I like it when it's cold in my home because it's easier to get warm than it is to get cool. If it's hot in my home, which is uncommon due to where I live, but much more common over the past 10 years, then it's uncomfortable in bed at night because one can simply, it's, there's just no way to get cooler, no simple way to get cooler. Um, some of my neighbors have actually installed air conditioners, which is a fairly bizarre change because ordinarily in my neighborhood, it rarely, very rarely approaches 70 degrees and nearly never goes above it. But for the past 10 years, it has regularly uh, been 70 to 80 degrees. Um, well, there have been spurts of hot weather, not regularly, but there have been spurts of it and much longer spurts than we're used to. Lots of relationships change when the weather becomes cold. I like to think that the trees begin to dream. Um, the ones who are dropping their leaves. However, there are also other organisms that thrive in the wintertime. Um, in, in para-Christian mythos, which I'm not one to ignore, um, it happens to be one of the lineages in which I've been steeped, uh, whether or not I certainly don't identify as a member of that lineage particularly, at least not in my public persona, but in my heart as a child of winter um, and the winter holidays, uh, these traditions are meaningful to me. So in the, uh, in the Arthurian legends, there is a feast that takes place around the Yuletide time. And there's a story about the Oak Knight and the Holly Knight. And I'll tell the story very briefly um, and poorly since I, I'm not too clear on its details and I may not remember them well. <laughs> and actually, my goal this evening was to talk primarily about memory rather than holidays. And yet, in a way, by talking about the passing of the seasons and the transformations associated with them, I am also speaking about memory. <laughs> um, so in the story, uh, the Knights of the Round Table are gathered at a feast with King Arthur in Camelot, perhaps. Um, much fun has been made of this by the Monty Python troupe, to, to good effect, <laughs> uh, Camelot that is. And um, 
they're having their winter feast and of course probably they are regaling each other with tales of heroism and perhaps other uh, feats that might include, you know, forms of success not directly related to battle, let's say, um, to keep it uh, discreet. <laughs> um, and a strange knight uh, comes to their, their, their gathering. And this knight, who I think arrives on a green horse, the knight is all green, as if perhaps his armor is made of foliage and leaves and greenery and branches, and he's a very unusual being. And he challenges the knights who are present um, to freely take a blow at him, to which he will not respond. And he says that in return, at the transformation of the season, the one who accepts his challenge must take a blow from him. And one of the knights, who I think is understood to be the Oak Knight, it's not Lancelot, and I cannot recall all of their names, um, but one of the very famous knights uh, takes, up his, you know, takes up the challenge and strikes him a terrible blow that severs his head. But the Green Knight is unperturbed, picks up his own head, and says, you know, I'll see you at the turning of the season when you will receive a blow from me and we will see then who prevails. Something like this. And um, this story is very complex and it relates to the relationship between the, the oak tree and the holly tree. The green knight, I believe, represents the oak tree, who now that winter has come, will appear to die. But it will be, in a sense, preserved in the holly that often encircles the oak and can be understood as its way of crossing the winter gap, its, its life line through the winter, in which its greenery is preserved and will reemerge in spring. Now, of course, we understand these as two separate distinct organisms clinically, and <laughs> it would be very unlikely for us moderns to think that the vitality of the oak tree is preserved in the holly tree and then somehow returned to the oak in the springtime. And yet, though peoples of old and ways of thinking of old differ from ours and may in some cases seem absurd or even impossible, they carry within them a form of wisdom alien to our modernity, but crucial to our intelligence. A form of forms of wisdom that, when they are lost, we are greatly impoverished by these losses. Terribly impoverished. So there's something beautiful and profound in this story um, that goes on, right, and is worth, uh, <laughs> is worth reading something about. Um, there's a wonderful book in which I learned this story for the first time um, about the unicorn tapestries. And I cannot recall the book, but if you were to look up just the unicorn tapestries and look for books related to that topic, I'm sure you will find it.
So the winter is not just a time of um, going to sleep and death. For some of the organisms, it's their time. It's their time of vitality. And for other organisms, it's, it's, a, it's a crossing way, right? We will, we will uh, reduce our, our energetic investment in overt existence, perhaps to dream, um, in subtle, we will, we will inhabit the subtle aspects of existence for a time. And thus, in that narrowing, we will create a bridge over what might otherwise be great travail, peril, crisis, danger, so that we can emerge in the spring renewed and safe and whole and hale. Now, <laughs> I get here to something more resembling my initial idea of a topic because here I'm speaking of an activity we might think of as crossing gaps. And in case it's not immediately obvious, what we refer to as memory, and in fact, our own experience and understanding, our consciousness of our identities, can only be made meaningful and coherent by a webwork of crossings between gaps, gaps between concepts, memories, moments, relationships, um, threats, opportunities, uh, histories, dreams, ideas, thoughts, feelings, a vast manifold of webworks as connected as if by strands across the gaps that would render them otherwise incoherent. And thus, um, unimaginable, uh, unthinkable, unknowable. So what is it that crosses these gaps between the concepts and ideas and memories and relationships and moments, the dreams, the hopes, the fears, the thoughts? What is it? What are these? What is the connective tissue of our mind? You know, what is that made of? And of the most, you know, the simplest answer which is an answer that's really no answer at all, is memory. In the Greek mythic traditions, mnemosyne, M-N-E-M-O-S-Y-N-E, mnemosyne, the source of the word mnemonic, and also the root of the word memory, and probably some other words um, that aren't coming immediately to mind. Mnemosyne was the mother of the muses, so this means she, she was their origin, and the muses were the arts. And, and back then, the arts were kind of very specific things like certain forms of poetry or certain forms of music or certain forms of dance and possibly history. They were, they were the, the subjects that we think of it when we think of subjects in education. But there were mm, either seven of them or nine of them, depending on which model you were using. <laughs> and I think they had names. I used to know all of their names. Um, but <laughs> my memory of their names has faded. Mm, I think one was Terpsichore. Mm, I, cannot, I cannot recall the other names at the moment, and these details are not as important as the encompassing context. Um, 
in which I presently am, am dwelling and on which I'm about which I am currently concerned. Um, a little aside is that the uh, in the movie Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, which was very important to me as a child because I was deeply concerned with the fate of the oceans, and as I still am. And people like um, Jacques Cousteau were heroes of mine. Uh, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey. Um, these people were, were heroes of mine. But um, Walt Disney made a movie out of Jules Verne's novel called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And Captain Nemo is literally um, the avatar of Mnemosyne, right? The champion of Mnemosyne, because mind and memory and dreaming, these are, uh, how shall I put this? These are expressions of the nature, divinity, and character of the waters. And so Captain Nemo was trying to protect the sea from the humans who wanted to build warships and other kinds of ships that would destroy the ocean for the sake of human hubris, um, meaning uh, grandiose, unjustified pride. And so I loved Captain Nemo um, and believed in his, his mission, and I still do. Now, of course, without memory, we'd have very little, right? We'd have nearly nothing. Um, but memory has its costs as well. It's dangerous to have memory as well as profound. But even when I use this word memory to describe what links all of the features of thought and remembrance, um, I'm not saying enough because we don't know anything about the links. What are the linking? What links the things together? And let's see, I'm on the verge of a thought here. Let's see if I can bring it forth. Memory. You see, without the links, it, it doesn't help us to remember things. And without memory, we certainly cannot have a mind or thoughts or identity. And there's one way of thinking about it where we can imagine that if memory were to suddenly disappear in a very particular way, we might experience liberation from ego. Um, but but I, I'm not sure that that would really be the dis disappearance of memory. Rather, it might be the disappearance of our identification with memory, our confusion. Um, of self with that which is remembered. And the feeling of ownership of our memories and, and these kinds of things. If, if only that identification could disappear, then we might experience liberation. But if memory itself were to disappear, it's very unclear what the resulting situation might be like. Now, in my model, which is a toy, of how human minds uh, work on Earth, I have the collection of all minds, and I think of that collection. Hello, hello. Hi. Good evening. <laughs> um, I think of that collection as an environment. So all of the human minds are an environment. Now, not just the human minds, all of the bee minds are environment, all the bird minds are an environment, and the sum total of minds on Earth are an environment. But we'll, for the moment, we'll think just about the human ones, and I'm going to call that collection the cognitium. And I want to think of it as like a dimension, a cognitive dimension, that is as complex as a physical world. But there are all these distinct minds associated with human bodies, and something connects them. Just as in our minds, memories 
are not just connected all um, willy-nilly, this to that, they're connected in meaningful networks, networks that help us understand what, what is meant by a word, right? To understand what is meant by a word, we have to know what the world is, what the sun is, what it means to be human, what food is, what dreaming is, what the difference between something that is largely physically real and something that is largely imaginary, all of these things, right? So there are many meaningful connections among the concepts in our minds. They're not merely all connected to everything, each other. And in, the, in my model of the, the human world, I call the connective elements between human minds. Um, and one of those is a recording device like the one I'm using now. Another is a telephone. Another is a computer. Another is people's voices. Another is vision. Um, and there are many, and there are some that we don't even have words for that are not ordinary. But I call the connective elements the mimula. And the mimula link human minds together and transmit single signals among them in various ways at various times for various purposes. Um, and sometimes in the cognicium, it is willy-nilly. Sometimes the connections aren't meaningful. And this is why our minds have to filter out a lot of the noise in our sensory and relational experience in order to produce something coherent enough to qualify or to, to nourish or sustain our sentience our, and our intelligence, our, um, the coherence of our mental environment and our awareness. So I believe that there's something like the mimula in our own personal memory. There are the, the connective elements that link concepts, experiences, dreams, thoughts, feelings, moments, situations, analyses, um, awareness, all of these things. There's, there's a specialized element that links them together. And it appears that dreaming is crucially important for the establishment and repair of these connective elements. So that without dreaming, or if dreaming is long interrupted or becomes, um, its quality is poor, then our memories begin to break down. Now, of course, other things can cause the breakdown of our memory as well as the loss of dreaming. There can be structural damage to the brain, there can be metabolic problems, all kinds of things. Uh, hopefully, I will be able to pick up where I've left off as I am now um, at one of the stops on my walk. And I probably won't continue my exploration while inside. So for the moment, I will pause and we'll pick up at um, somewhere near the analog of the mimula in our own minds. So it turns out in thinking about memory and even this neologism, um, chism of the mimula that there's another peculiar feature, and this, this feature is preserved in the human uh, level aspects of the cognicium, right? How minds exchange information, signals, and compose meaning together, or meaning isn't always composed. It's a bit more complex than that, but um, one of the key ingredients, whether we're thinking about how signals get, get transferred in, in human cultures um, among human beings or how things are linked in our minds, <clears throat> a key feature is routes. You know, I've just been to the grocery store and I followed a specific route to get there. My goal wasn't to go to the grocery store, however. My goal was to go for a walk, essentially to get some exercise. 
Um, it just so happens that I know the grocery store is on my route. And in, once I'm at the grocery store, I know the routes inside to the various items that I may be interested in or looking for. So the weird thing about routes is in memory, in human memory, in our local memories, well, there are many unusual things and features about routes that are important, but it appears that memories have something like associative clusters of links and, and that we're inclined to use shortcuts to, if it's probably not, I mean, it's the idea that we have is that we retrieve memories, right? But probably something much more complex is going on. And that's something I think is closely related to dreaming because to remember often involves an aspect or a behavior of mental activity, cognitive activity that resembles envisioning or dreaming, imagining, right? And so when we can't find the name of that actor in that movie, we may take shortcuts. And this is when it becomes apparent that there are associative clusters to memory elements. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sidestep here briefly to a linguistic topic. It's very interesting to notice that to remember literally implies to be made whole again, right? To have a member that was lost or um, severed rejoined to us. And this idea is also uh, emergent in the etymology of the word religion. It means like to re-ligament, to bind back together. And so it's interesting that the word that we have for remembering, for recalling to awareness in present consciousness, is a word that implies um, making whole again, right? It, it literally, it's something like healing. So when we can't find something in memory, the name of that actor, the name of that book, the name of that movie, so on, the name of a plant, the name of an insect, um, the Blackfoot word for the moon. We may start to use um, little, how shall I put this? Small features at the edge of the associative cluster in which the element we're seeking is ordinarily um, linked with, yeah, which, with, with which the element we're seeking is ordinarily linked. And so we may remember, for example, that, and this is not a very useful chunk or hint, that the actor's name starts with B, or um, they were in this other movie with this other actress whose name we do remember. Um, we'll, we may go looking for one of the near links in the associative cluster. And most of us are familiar with the experience of, and by the way, when we're doing that, we're taking advantage of route, um, what we call it, route resemblance or route coherence. Um, so that As we begin to traverse a related route, the route we're seeking may light up in awareness and suddenly become retrievable.
I'm coming to the very big hill. I'm on the small hill right now, so my breathing's a bit labored, but um, it's going to become a lot more labored shortly. <laughs> this is a very steep part of my walk route. <laughs> Now, many of us know that we, we may have the experience of having something, quote, on the tip of our tongue, unquote. This trope means, the translation of this trope is something like, I know that I know what I'm looking to recall, but I cannot find it at the moment. And it feels as if it is just out of reach. It's right near, of course, we're using um, haptic metaphors or analogies here for memory, right? Just out of reach. As if the uh, organ with which we retrieve things from memory is a hand. And this is actually turns out to be very important in ways that I may not have time to pursue because the hand has changed what it's possible to be as an animal for our species and has radically transformed our brains, bodies, minds, civilizations, life on Earth. Um, so it's, it's a central, crucially central um, metaphor because it's physically central to the evolution and development of our unique nature as cognitive animals. So many of us have had the experience of having something on the tip of our tongue, right? Which is also another metaphor that associates the tongue with memory. Um, and those of us who are familiar with this uh, often frustrating feeling, many of us have learned a peculiar fact about this problem, which is that as you are attempting to remember something and you find yourself in this situation where it's on the tip of your tongue, just out of reach, what usually is helpful is not to double down on the attempt to retrieve it. Um, for some reason, and I think it's related to route uh, symmetry, right? And route coherence. By symmetry, I mean um, when we can't recall something, it may be that we're playing with a route that whose symmetry matches what we're trying to retrieve, but doesn't lead to it. And so if we relax, and instead of trying to drive a straight line to the desired um, memory element, if we relax, then the aspect that searches routes can circle rather than angle, make an angle. And in that circling, we're much more likely to become able to, re to find the route that leads us to the retrieval of the element we were seeking. So in many cases, trying harder is a move that ends in failure. <laughs> and what we need to try to do is to try softer. And that often produces the desired result. It takes time to learn this, however. Um, not all of us are uh, familiar in this way with what might have to do with, it might have something to do with our hippocampus, um, the organ in the brain that may be involved in associating memories and producing 
the web-like associative networks between the elements that without those associations are meaningless and incoherent. Whew. Okay, that was a tough climb. <laughs> um, all right, routes. So, some people who've studied uh, memorization skills and have become um, extremely adept at memorizing complex things, such as digits of pi, capitals of cities in the world, um, other kinds of lists, but not just lists, and not just catalogs of data. Um, some people can use this skill much more meaningfully than the relatively trivial uh, and sort of left hemispheric dominant <laughs> um, goals that by themselves have little meaningful value. Some people have rediscovered an art that we've been aware of from um, old writings in Greek and perhaps Latin and possibly even Sanskrit. It's not unlikely that there are writings that vastly predate the Greeks, though we usually hear about the Greeks here in the West rather than the, uh, rather than the, the Indian people. Um, so they had, they had this toy or um, a method called a memory palace. And a memory palace is a structure in one's imagination where one can store and retrieve complex memory elements, such as, for example, uh, the Latinate names of a thousand common plants. Um, I can see that I'm going to be in some fairly serious wind here for a while. So what I'm going to try to do is maybe, well, I'll keep going for a little bit. So a memory palace allows you to associate a memory element with a place. And it turns out that if you, if you speak with elderly Native American people, as you travel with them across the land in which their ancestors um, developed and you know, existed prior to colonization, sometimes afterwards to some degree, um, the land awakens stories in their minds. And they will tell you, oh, here is where, you know, this battle was fought, and here is where we found the plant that became the paint, and here is where my great-grandmother uh, met my great-grandfather, and so on and so forth, right? And if you think about it, for most of human evolutionary history, we didn't live in boxes. And so the formation of memory was deeply associated with landscape and place, living places, living creatures, trees, rocks, rivers, waters, deserts, plains, all of these kinds of things, so that it's entirely natural for our memory to become richer, more vivid, and more accessible when we are including place in the creation of memory, but also in what we think of as the retrieval of memories. <laughs> the topic is endlessly fascinating, and the relationship between dreaming and memory is extremely profound, um, but I don't have time to explore it today. So for the moment, um, because it's so windy, where I am, I think what I'm going to do is wrap up today's walk and talk. Um, and thank you for, for joining me. I look forward to learning and exploring, remembering and discovering 
again very soon. Bye-bye for now.